as, uh, as some of you know, um, I am a half-time member of one of the classes here, the class of 89. So I'm... <laughs> uh, the uh, the uh, president of Harvard at the time thought a half a year only half-baked me, so <laughs> they kept me around for the next 10 years. And after that, they figured maybe if I hadn't gotten it by then, I was never going to get it. So <laughs> I had a chance to be with an awful lot of you and many of the classes before and a few after are full of old friends of mine, so there's no better place to be this weekend, this very minute. And I want to thank you, Anne-Marie, for carving out time before a very special audience of journalists for a, an award for a very special kind of journalism, the uh, I.F. Stone Award. Uh, and on behalf of the uh, advisory committee that makes the award, I want to notice that our spark plug, Myra McPherson, is here with us today. And uh, and on behalf of that committee, I just want to uh, I just want to uh, say a few words uh, about the recipient, but only a few because I want her to have time to talk with you uh, so you can see the journalist that we're honoring today. Jeremy Stone, uh, Izzy Stone's son, uh, founded this award and he designed the medal, this medal that uh, Jane will get. And around the rim of the uh, medal, he has inscribed the, uh, the hope that the work of the recipient of this award would represent a fulcrum for journalism of independence, independence journalism, the kind of journalism that Izzy Stone practiced. And from the beginning of her career, Jane Mayer started in a small weekly newspaper in Vermont and carrying through her career at the uh, Washington Star, Wall Street Journal, and now New Yorker Magazine. She has built a foundation on deep digging and an independence of mind in order to reveal the truth about the subjects that she chooses to write about. It's the kind of journalism that searched out information overlooked by others like that which exposed President Obama for his prosecutorial excesses and the charges that he had brought against uh, a uh, NSA, NAS uh, analyst, Thomas Drake. Information that led to the dismissal of all the major charges against Drake. It's the kind of work that documented President George Bush's arrogation of unprecedented power to himself, not only ignoring American law, but international law as well, in order to adopt torture as an American instrument of war against the terrorist, a documentation that other journalists later recognized as a comprehensive bill of indictment against the president. And the kind of work that takes on, that she took on along with Jill Abramson to demonstrate through hundreds of interviews and scores of documents just how much verified information there was available to the Congress on the character of Clarence Thomas before Congress voted him onto the US Supreme Court. A subject that most other journalists shied away from not because it was not vitally important to the American people and the future of the country, but because it might seem to be politically incorrect to report it. At a time when any government official, any commercial enterprise, and any vested special interest can, with a single tap of a finger, introduce its own version of events on any subject of importance, 
embedded in its own special interest and its own point of view, it becomes vital that we hold up a point of view that's represented here today. It becomes important that we make sure work like Jane Mayer's is recognized and noticed for what it is, reporting through which shines an independence of mind about the selection of subject matter, the tireless depth that reporting and documentation takes in order to make it clear in the presentation of the work itself that it is a mind in search of the facts to reveal the truth. Jane Mayer's work is the work that can serve as a fulcrum to a new generation of journalistic independence. And Jane, if you can come up, I would like very much to pass this award on to you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. I am really, really honored to be here today. I'm also, I have to admit, a little bit surprised um, because there's a bit of a backstory to this event, um, which is that many, many months ago, um, I was uh, deeply down a rabbit hole, kind of in a fog, working on a book, and I noticed an email that I had overlooked, and it was from Bill Kovic. And Bill now, as we all know, is a legend in journalism and one of those names that conjures up the kind of editor that every reporter dreams of. Thoughtful, decent, smart, courageous, and fair. And um, to be honest, when writing a book, really any kind of procrastination is <laughs> uh, welcome. So I happily clicked on it. And, um, the message said that the people who run the IF Stone Award were looking for names of reporters to nominate for it. And so I gave it some thought and poked around a little bit, and I sent in the name of a colleague who I thought was deserving and didn't think more of it. Then a number of months after that, um, when I looked at my email again, lo and behold, there was another email from Bill Kovic. Um, and so I clicked on it again, and it said, surprise, that they were <laughs> going to be giving the medal to me. And so all I can say is that I think after all of the uh, work that I've done on the Bush administration, I did learn a thing or two from Dick Cheney. So. <laughs> uh, okay, but since I do have a few minutes here today, um, and since we're here to celebrate the inimitable Izzy Stone and his trailblazingly independent coverage of government, power, and corruption, as well as the 75th anniversary of the Neiman program, I wanted to reflect on a couple concerns um, on the current state of the profession, which I think Stone also might have been concerned about. Um, and then in the spirit of Izzy, I am gonna turn over the floor to all of you before I become a pontificating blowhard of the variety that he couldn't stand. So um, this won't take too long. Um, I, I wanted first to sketch the outlines of the landscape when it comes to covering government and others in power. Um, Myra McPherson's wonderful biography of Stone is entitled All Governments Lie, which is a condensation of Stone's statement that all governments are run by liars. Um, I've got huge respect for many of the government officials I've covered, but at the same time I have to agree that the relationship between those of us in the press and the people we cover, if you do your job right, is full of tension and often downright hostility. Stone was famous for being an outsider who disparaged some of the insiders like Walter Lippmann. And while I think there's room for both kinds of coverage, I tend to agree with Stone on his skepticism about getting too cozy. I learned this lesson early on, not long after coming to Washington in 1984 to cover the Reagan White House for the Wall Street Journal. I learned that Reagan's embattled national security advisor was about to resign. So using the privileged access I had as reporter for the Wall Street Journal, I quickly went to see him and asked him about this point blank. 
and with sort of warm brown eyes that kind of looked like a, a, you know, a trustworthy Labrador retriever, he looked across the desk at me and told me that he had absolutely no plans to resign. Uh, <laughs> So I may be telescoping this in memory, but as I remember it, the very next day, after I'd shelved my story, they announced his resignation. Um, and I was stunned. Government officials lie. They lie to reporters boldly and straight-faced. And it taught me that access is overrated, which is something to keep in mind in this era of celebrity interviews. And that they may look friendly and be wonderfully inspirational and be really attractive characters and the kind of people you wish you could be friends with, but never to forget that the relationship between the reporters and the subjects that we cover in power is by necessity one that is adversarial and sometimes um, full of distrust and opposition. Small lies like the one, that minor one, um, seem relatively minor today. Um, now that we've seen things like a government practically manufacturing a false rationale for a war or denying the existence of a torture program. But the lesson remains the same. As Stone put it, you can't just sit on their lap and ask them to feed you secrets. Then they'll just give you a lot of crap. <laughs> the other thing I learned early on while covering the Reagan White House, and which I think bears remembering today, is that when you do hop off their laps, as Stone's own struggles illustrated, you're not going to get pats on the head. As we deal with the augmented powers of the growing national security state, it's worth remembering that those in power are rarely on the side of, of a fully free and transparent coverage. A minor brush I had in the Reagan White House alerted me to this dynamic. Eager to reveal the extensive and expensive stagecraft behind Reagan's presidency, I thought it would be great to fly to Granada a week ahead of the president's visit there to celebrate the first anniversary of America's victory over leftist forces on the tiny backward Caribbean island. I have to remember, though, also my bureau chief at the time, Al Hunt, when I gave him the story proposal, picked it up, and he said, I smell a little suntan lotion on this thing. <laughs> <laughs> but I've been very lucky to work for fantastic places, the Wall Street Journal and then the New Yorker, and they indulged me. So anyway, I went to Grenada a week ahead of the president, and I watched as the president's image advisors oversaw the paving of all these little dirt roads with beautiful new asphalt, and one Air Force cargo plane after the next landed in this little dirt patch of an airport um, carrying limousines and ambulances and bleachers and flags and everything else. And um, anyway, it made for a great story, but when the offending story was published, what I remember was sitting in the press briefing room as a young reporter, and the, the, the president's spokesman at the time, Larry Speaks, looked across the podium at me. He was like red-faced and angry, and he said, you are out of business. Um, <laughs> so then my colleagues at the time sort of thoughtfully and um, um, generously held a going out of business sale. Um, <laughs> they, they carried my, my desk and chair onto the lawn of the White House. Um, <laughs> but, but, you know, behind the hijinks um, was a serious message, which is that when reporters challenge the official narrative, those in power are going to push back, and sometimes very hard. As Myra McPherson recounted, um, the British publisher Lord Northcutt excuse me, Lord Northcliffe, admitted that news is something someone wants to suppress. All the rest is advertising. So in that long ago minor instance, my access dried up completely, and I soon found myself berated by editors for missing stories. I was unable to get a single phone call returned. I couldn't even get the president's schedule. Um, so the price of independence is high. They really do sometimes want to put you out of business. Um, today, however, the threat isn't just about being put out of business. It's about being put in jail. And this is what I wanted to get to. The government's growing prosecution of national security leakers under the Espionage Act, I think, is a watershed escalation of the longstanding tensions between the government and the fourth estate, blurring the distinction between journalism and espionage and between dissent and treason. I fear that vital coverage will be in peril if we allow this to become the new normal. 
the chill's already palpable. Several sources of mine have faced federal investigations. They've had to hire lawyers at draining personal expense. They've had to undergo enormous personal strain. Just a few weeks ago, a new potential source asked whether his emails and phone calls were protected if he conversed with me. Even though I now know how to use an encrypted email program, I couldn't really reassure him totally, which of course impedes news gathering. Right after the fall of the Berlin Wall, I wrote about the Stasi for the Wall Street Journal. I was there as an unimaginably vast archive of government spying on private citizens was opened. And I was so deeply impressed by how lucky we are in this country not to live under a totalitarian state. So I take the threat of the government's expanded surveillance powers seriously and think it's essential that as reporters, editors, and publishers we speak up. Or as Stone put it, almost every generation in American history has had to face what appeared to be a menace of so frightening an order as to justify the imitation, of, excuse me, the limitation of basic liberties. But he argued, a newspaper man ought to use his power on behalf of those who are getting the dirty end of the deal. And when he has something to say, he ought to not be afraid to raise his voice above a decorous mumble and use the 48 point bold. <laughs> and so on that note, I want to take some questions from all of you. So. Here come a couple. All right, there are mics too. There's one over there. Yes, um, my question is, as reporters, when we write stories that we know that the officials don't like, our, atti our attitudes can be, well, screw them, you know? Um, and if they begin to push back, we almost sort of feel good about ourselves because we're pissing them off, we're doing something right. But, I, but I've seen instances where that can lead to arrogance on the part of the reporter, and I wonder if that's an issue that, that you, you think about or, or grapple with. Well, I basically try not to think about the effect on the people that I cover when I write about them. I try always to keep in mind the reader instead. Um, so the relationship that really matters to me is to try to tell the readers as much as I possibly can or as much as I possibly know of the truth. Um, I mean, so I try, it's, it's not about getting back at people you cover or helping people you cover. I just try not to think about it that way. It's all about getting the truth and, and that's for the readers and that's so that they can make informed choices in this fabulous democracy. So that's, that's what I think about. Over here. Yes, I just wanted to know what was the most serious threat you got from the government? Um, from the government, you know, I've been asked um, at times by the CIA not to publish things. Um, and I suppose we felt a little bit of peril at the New Yorker, but it's an amazing staff of editors and lawyers there. Um, and we, for instance, published the name of someone who they asked us not to. It was not an undercover person, um, but it was someone who they said whose life might have been in danger if we published it. And so there was a, a very heated exchange over this. Um, we decided to go with exposing the officer because um, he, first of all, had put his own name out in promotional material in some ways, so it wasn't the biggest secret in the world, even though it would appear in a different context in this story. But he, um, as far as my reporting was able to show, appeared to have tortured somebody to death. And I felt it was important for there to be some kind of accountability and not to use national security reasons for him to hide behind the kind of accountability that we require in our system. So I also, it was interesting, I went to his house, I wanted to speak to him about it before we published it, and um, I wanted to be able to show that people who do things like that, people who end up you know, torturing a, a detainee, are not necessarily somebody that's completely alien, but he was actually 
a family man with a nice suburban house whose kids played in sports games, who'd been stuck in a very scared and scary position. And I thought it was important to sort of show the larger dynamics of what happens when the government puts um, employees in a program where they might end up doing the wrong thing because they put so much pressure on them. So in order to tell a story, I, I, I wanted to name him. And we did, and we didn't, there were, there were no repercussions, though he was <laughs> really angry about it. But um, anyway, the government wasn't happy about it, but we went ahead with it, so. No threats. I mean, I, you know, I don't, I, the most threatening story I have written in a way is not about a government figure. It was the story I did about um, a couple of billionaires who fund politics, um, the, Co the Koch brothers. <laughs> and uh, after that story, or as I was working on that story, it turns out, simultaneously, and who knows, maybe just coincidentally, I became the subject of a privatized investigation into everything in my life. Um, looking into legal files, former romances, um, you name it. Um, everything was turned over. Every story I'd written, books I'd written. They put a, progr a, a program, all my writing through some kind of forensic program that looks for plagiarism. And, and, and were hoping to try to expose me in some way or another. And that was actually pretty threatening and scary. Uh, um, luckily, um, it all fell apart, and then, to its amazing credit, the New York Post media correspondent, Keith Kelly, um, wrote a story about it saying, who's trying to frame this reporter? Um, and dangled a couple possibilities that were much like the people I was covering. And um, uh, <laughs> um, so it, it, it blew up, but that, that was scary. That you felt like you were, you were certainly feeling pressure on. So. And over, over there. Hi, Jane. Danny Schechter, congratulations Hi, on the, your award. Izzy would be very proud uh, that you are, you'll be wearing this medal to various functions around <laughs> town. Uh, it's very heavy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like those people that wear those Mercedes. Um, yeah. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> a rapper. <laughs> you know, we, we, a lot of us, at least of my generation, I'm not sure which one it is, but, you know, felt like the Republicans, the, the Reagans, the the Nixons, they were the bad guys. The Democrats were, were somehow of a different order, particularly President Obama. You've been covering this White House and this president. Help us understand the psychology, the mentality uh, you know, of this person who many saw as sort of the second coming and now see as the second coming of, of Richard Nixon. <laughs> Well, um, you know, one of the great things about being a reporter, not a pundit, is you only have to generally go out in public when you know the answers to things. So I'm not sure I have all of the answers to that. But I, 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 I've been struck by a few things, it, particularly in the national security area, which is, um, you know, thinking about the drones program, um, which in many ways is a, a, a continuation of, of the Bush years and an escalation of it, and in these, these leak prosecutions as well. And, um, and then in some of the surveillance issues also. And I think that the, the dynamic that those three programs have in common is um, a, that the, this administration, I think, has been to some extent overpowered by the tremendously powerful national security apparatus in Washington since 9-11. It's, it's grown and grown and grown. And if you look at the Justice Department, there's a whole division of national security which is there to promote the views of the, the CIA and the other national security um, parts of the government. But there's no office of civil liberties. There's no office of the First Amendment. Um, and in fact, Eric Holder recently, after being criticized for subpoenaing reporters' records in two cases, brought, um, invited some reporters and editors and bureau chiefs in, and I went in, in with some of them because I'm on the reporters' committee for the freedom of the press. And he, he kind of you know, seemed surprised at how far they'd gone out on a limb and seemed almost as if he hadn't thought about it enough. And um, what struck me looking around the room was you know, they, they were almost all national security people advising him. And I think you know it's a little bit like if you, if you go to uh, um, you know a, 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 a doctor with a, a backache and you go to a, a, a surgeon, they're going to want to cut, and, and that's kind of basically 
um, what was going on over there. If you go to a yoga instructor, they might tell you to stretch, but there are no yoga instructors in the Justice Department right now. So <laughs> it's, it's, it's been tipped way far to the balance, and I think the other thing is something that a, a, a Harvard Law professor here who was in the Bush administration um, warned people about, Jack Goldsmith, and he said he thought that when Obama took office, he would do much the same as Bush on some of these, these issues. And he said the reason is nobody in office really wants to risk being the one that has the second attack on their hands because they, you know, and there may be a second attack, but they don't want to be open to criticism that they didn't do everything they could. So the political um, damage, or, you know, is what they worry about a lot. And, and I think that is what they worry about. And I think the answer is people on the other end of the spectrum need to speak up and say there's there are costs to this and you need to balance it. Just to follow up very quickly, you know, we are at Harvard uh, right now, and, and of course uh, the president was a professor at the Harvard Law School. Do we as uh, Harvard alumni have a right to expect a higher uh, sense of uh, duty and responsibility in this part? Now, no, I'm saying this knowing that Henry Kissinger was also a professor uh, here at Harvard. Ted Cruz was a graduate of the law school. <laughs> I'm a Yaley. <laughs> so. Hello, uh, my name is Laura Julie Perrault. I'm a journalist from Canada, uh, and I'm a current Neiman. And um, I was listening to your story, and uh, the country I come from, that most people don't think anything's going on there, as a government that's basically stopped talking to journalists and only respond to us with uh, really short emails and never lets us ask backup questions. And we have so far done a terrible job at talking about how this is affecting our work or getting the public to actually care about that. And you mentioned earlier how much it had an impact that people actually wrote about the pressures you were under. How can we do efficient reporting about ourselves, about, about the pressure the press is under? Ooh. Um, I mean, I, do, I was really struck by Robert Caro's talk, which I thought was wonderful, and Anne Hull was wonderful, um, by the way, his advice that you need to always go see the person. He, you know, of course, he's got all the luxury of time, but I, I, I think email is a real problem for reporters because, among other things, people consider their answers in such a careful way that they don't just open up and, 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 and hold forth. I, I think you get much less good quotes and, um, you know, all, it's, it's, it's definitely degrading the, the final stories, I think. I don't know. I don't know enough about Canadian journalism, but, um, um, you know, I don't think the public really wants to hear us belly aching. I think they will just want us to keep turning out great stories. And I guess if the example of I.F. Stone is you don't even need to be, um, you know, have incredible access to get great stories. I mean, I think it helps to get great quotes, but he obviously just read all the documents really closely. Sometimes if you find something in a document, they actually will then make time to see you if it's bad enough. So, <laughs> so over here. So uh, after I finished my Neiman year, I moved from the supply side of journalism to the demand side. Um, I teach a course called News Literacy where we try to get students to be critical about the information they're getting from whatever source. And um, every semester, we put Bill Keller on trial for treason. Uh, we use the Swift case. Uh, this semester, actually, we've started to use Glenn Greenwald. It's really interesting to hear students struggle with these issues. Um, you know, they each play one side of the prosecution or defense team. And I guess the thing I'm hoping, because I think is this is being videotaped, so I'm hoping to grab the clip. I'm interested in this question that students always ask, which is, OK, if power is premised on secrecy, which I think is a pretty good premise, where is that? Where do we make those decisions about how much a government can keep secret and for how long? Because well, certainly, you know, in your work, you've sort of had to balance this in deciding what to put in print. And so I'm just curious what, what your answer would be on that. Well, I, I, I don't really accept the premise. In fact, I was very impressed by a book that Daniel Patrick Moynihan wrote that's about secrecy, that 
basically argues secrecy weakens power. I, th I think for the most part, it should be the exception to the rule and that better decisions are made when there's a competition of ideas and they takes place in broad daylight. I mean, that's the whole idea of our system. And so I, I think secrecy leads to often very poor decision making and that's really what happened during the Bush years in the CIA. Um, and it would have been much better if there'd been Public, more public debate. It's also how we get legitimacy in this country. You need to have public support. Um, and I actually think the public is often quite sensible. So I don't, I guess I don't accept the premise. I think secrecy is important for some intelligence operations and certainly military operations. That's, and I that's think actually the press more where they end up getting stuck. I think everybody agrees on the government end, but on the but operations some. end, mm -hmm. at what point does operational secrecy you know, at what point do you, as a journalist, think about operational secrecy and say, you know what, I'm going to inject and make the decision that this operation needs to be exposed? A lot. I mean, I think this is something very, that, that journalists have to be very thoughtful and editors about and not just do a knee jerk, we're going to publish because we have it. I mean, not all secrets are equal. And some, some are really important for the public to know, and some are really important to keep secret because people's lives are in the balance. Um, you know, I would never publicize a military operation about to take place. Um, I, I think, though, what's, what I would like to see is the government do a better job of it, not just saying national security is at risk. Explain it. So before, if we're going to hold back a story, which is a very big deal um, in this country, you really w ought to be given strong evidence that national security really is at risk. Because frequently we see things like the Drake case that Belkovich mentions, where it, it, it wasn't at risk. It, he was going to be prosecuted as if he was some major spy, and he totally was not. Um, and sometimes it's just a turf war, or it's about covering up something embarrassing. So I, anyway, I, I think that, that you know it requires thoughtfulness on the press's part, but also um, dialogue with the government on these things. I forgot to tell you the good news is that Keller is almost always acquitted. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> so over there, this. Yeah. Uh, what are your thoughts about the usefulness of a federal shield law? And, and second, if, if you are working on a sensitive story and you think all your electronic communications may be subject to government interception, what do you do? Go back to meeting Deep Throat in the parking lot? Yes, basically. I mean, I've started, I've been meeting with people in person. And, and on the Drake story, I had to fly out to the other side of the country to interview someone in a hotel room who, you know, wouldn't stay on the phone for more than about a second. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's very cumbersome. It's, it's expensive. It's time consuming. It's difficult. It's, you know, it requires people who really are committed to telling you Things and and often sources are sort of semi-committed, but it 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 really raises the stakes. Um, so I'm sorry. What was your first on the federal shield law? On the shield law, um, I you know I I I I don't really know, but I think it's a step in the right direction. I think the problem is there are a couple two major problems with it. One, there's a there's a loophole for national security. Um, um, s stories, so it won't protect sources in the national security arena, which I think is really where they need the most protection. And the other is, of course, this issue of of who's a journalist and yeah. and and the government licensing and deciding who's a, who's a real journalist and who's not. I think it's definitely worth trying. I think I think it's we need help, and um, for somebody like uh, James Risen, it would be a big help right now. So, um, but it's passed the Senate. And like everything else, is um, falling apart in the House of Representatives. Yeah, right. So, anyway, over there. Yeah, I, um, I want to really thank you for framing the question and presenting us with this very clear image uh, for journalists. You know, I wonder sometimes if journalists were too focused on personalities. We think that Obama will be different than Bush, and Bush is different than so and so. And I'm wondering to what extent you've seen a structural continuity between the expansion of government under Bush and how it's been exercised under Obama. Is Obama falling into patterns that are already there for him? Is, is, it, is it really a, a political or is it a structural change in the, the structure of the way the government is operating under Bush? Well, I mean, I, I think Obama's quite different from Bush. I don't see them as the same at all, really. But I, I do think, and I think the founders of the country were, were obviously smart about this, that there's something about power 
that likes to um, perpetuate itself, <laughs> and and um, and that goes across party lines completely. Um, it's just human nature, and and that's you know I guess the argument was that's why we you know if men were angels we wouldn't need laws, but I feel like they could also ask, and we would add we we wouldn't need reporters, but we do. So <laughs> I was thinking of structural changes like the expansion of the NSA. The expansion of government of certain uh, executive uh, uh, powers of the signature and the rest of that hasn't Obama just continued what Bush created for him? Did Bush expanded the clothes that Obama then can wear. Well, I, I mean, I think you know, and some things have expanded and some have not. I mean, they really did end the secret prisons in which mm -hmm. um, detainees were being tortured, and they have you know closed down that particular program, which I think is a vast improvement. Um, but I do think the national security establishment is, is just immensely powerful in Washington at this point. And it, you know, it, I mean, and it, people have been warning about it since Eisenhower about the military industrial complex and terrorism is a business. Um, so, you know, it's again an area that's really great for reporting. So Thanks ripe much. for it. So, okay. Okay, over there. Um, yeah, hi. Uh, I'm Bina Sarwar. I'm a Neiman from Pakistan, um, back in Cambridge now. So I just want to, there's two things I want to ask you about. One is um, just what you just said, which is actually the second thing, because I was going to ask you about something else, about the, um, uh, how terrorism is a business. And as journalists, I mean, this is a dilemma. I really don't know how this can be resolved. But the fact is that terrorists strike now knowing that the media is going to amplify their actions and it's going to create that impact. And that's why they go to the uh, shopping mall in Kenya that all the expats go to and they're not hitting the bazaar down the street where the locals go and so on. And so perhaps they wouldn't be doing this if, they were, if their actions weren't being amplified the way they are. And we've see, I've seen this in Pakistan, I've seen this elsewhere. That's one thing. And the second thing is about the, the surveillance expansion and um, the security question. And of course, I mean, that's such a dilemma, right? Because you have, as you said, it's expanded everywhere. And we've seen even now the diplomatic missions are more and more staffed by security agencies and that are withholding visas to genuine, uh, you know, visa seekers and because they're, they're looking at everything from a security prism. And um, the, the uh, excuse or the justification for the surveillance obviously is the terrorism question, which, as you've said, is a business. And how, does, how do you, um, I mean, I suppose it's something everybody has to grapple with, but how, would, how do you see this whole issue of na security? I think maybe you might have already kind of answered that, but, you know, <laughs> so maybe I'm being redundant. But, you know, the fact that, you know, the, the, the surveillance is maybe trying to tap into, you know, to actually stop terrorism, but actually it's not because the guy who does the um, shooting in the uh, Batman movie, I mean, there was no security surveillance on him, and they were all focusing on the Muslims. So, sort of a... So, um, you know, I, I, it's a big subject, big, many questions. Um, I, I, I have found it heartening that um, Obama has said in a speech a few months ago that he thought it was time that the, the war on terror came to an end. Um, and that, you know, the closer I think we can get to a state of norm, normality, pre-9-11 normality, and, and, and deal with terrorism, this is not a popular view of, of many people, but deal with it as a crime um, exactly. and not a full-fledged war, we'll be on a different legal footing then. And I think, I think that, you know, it's certainly worth having a big debate about in the country. I don't know how long we can stay on, on that kind of war footing. Um, it's also just... It obviously incredibly expensive. So um, anyway, over here. OK. Um, thank you for your comments. Uh, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about private intimidation. We've, you, you talked a lot about the government intimidating you. And you mentioned just briefly about the billionaire brothers. Is that a new and in some ways, I mean, if you get sent to jail, you get sent to jail. And then the entire country is up in arms. And, and you know we all support you. But if you get destroyed and your credibility destroyed, you know, then you're lost as a voice and everybody says, oh, well, you know, it was somebody who plagiarized or it was somebody controversial, you know, that controversial author says blah, 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 and we can dismiss it. Could you talk about that, please? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's something that all reporters have to be pretty mindful of now in an age when there is every, in every email conversation you have, there's a, a, a 
a track record. Um, there's a there's a written record of of when you try to get an interview with somebody. Um, you have to, I think, always conduct yourself carefully as if you're in public um, when you know when you're dealing with professional things, even even your reporting, and not and just be careful about things like acting responsibly so you don't give people fodder to take you down, basically. Um, it, 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 it makes it a little less fun, but I'd say it's, it's still, um, to end with Izzy Stone, probably the most fun kind of <laughs> life you could have. It's the most interesting, and I think, what it, was it he said famously that if he had any more fun, he'd have to be arrested? So <laughs> I feel the same way. <laughs>